Despite being one of the most well-known pieces in the clarinet repertoire, much uncertainty surrounds Mozart's concerto for clarinet, K622. While it was initially sketched for basset horn, we can now be fairly certain that the concerto was, in fact, written for basset clarinet. A conventional non-basset clarinet usually has E3 as its lowest note, but the basset clarinet extends down to C3. Mozart wrote the concerto for Anton Stadler, who pioneered the use of such a clarinet with this extended lower range. However, the basset clarinet never really gained widespread use. Presumably because of this, the three early editions of the concerto, published around 10 years after Mozart died in 1791, all included the same transcription of the basset clarinet part for a conventional non-basset clarinet. This lecture recital will include passages played both on my non-basset clarinet and the Royal College of Music's basset clarinet. It's been a great experience to play a basset clarinet for the first time over the last few months, and, as you will hear, it does have a notably different tone colour to my non-basset clarinet. However, I do have to briefly mention at this stage that some of the low notes on the instrument are a little bit flat. The early editions, from around 1801, as well as Mozart's undated sketch of the opening 199 bars for basset horn, K621b, are the main sources for the concerto. All four differ substantially. When coupled with the fact that we lack any complete autograph for the concerto, this means that it is impossible to create a wholly reliable edition. There are some editions from the last 50 years or so which do reasonably synthesise these sources. The 2003 Behring Writer edition is probably the best of these, with parts for both basset and non-basset clarinet. However, I don't play the exact pictures printed in either of these parts. In the basset clarinet part, not all of the reconstruction seems hugely convincing to me, and the non-basset part simply reprints the pictures found in the traditional transcription. With such ambiguities, the 21st century performer has many options when approaching this concerto. While this enables us to create a deeply personal reading, this has to come from more than just the notes on the page. Late 18th century notation does not render the nuances of contemporary performing practices. Because of this, I will consider the concerto from three different angles, looking at how scores, the instrument that we use, and primary sources, such as Tromlitz's 1791 treatise on flute playing, affect how I perform this work. To try to create a coherent sense of how the concerto progresses, I will work through it chronologically. To start, here is the clarinet's opening entrance in the first movement, played on my non-basset clarinet.
Much of this opening section is the same whether played on non-basset or basset clarinet. It is only in the final few bars that problems arise. We do have K621B for this passage, so we know how these bars should be played on basset clarinet. However, in the Bärenreiter part for non-basset clarinet, they're printed very differently. I amend the voice leading in an attempt to retain a better sense of the wonderful change in register that we get in this point when using a basset clarinet. To show how notable this shift is, here is the passage with a brief lead-in on basset clarinet. According to the 19th century biographer Otto Jahn, Anton Stadler, for whom the concerto was written, had argued with Mozart over the difficulty of certain passages in the clarinet part. This may well have been one such place. Before the creation of the Müller or Bohème systems in the 19th century, a clarinet only had one fingering for notes below G3, meaning that the fifth finger on either hand often had to slide between notes in low passages, making any such passage rather intractable. Notably, when rewriting this passage, Mozart did not just transpose it up an octave. Instead, he changed the melodic line, which enabled him to keep the notable change in tessitura at this point. However, it does mean that this passage is different in the exposition and recapitulation. It is because of this that I think it's so important to try to retain as much of a sense of tombal shift here as possible when performing on a non basset clarinet. My next excerpt comes from the centre of the movement. The bars on the slide come at the centre of this passage and can be played in two ways. We cannot know which version is in Mozart's full autograph as we don't have it. I happen to prefer the first because it maintains the relatively high tessitura established at this point, but either is entirely valid. The other important matter to consider here is ornamentation. We know, as Tromlitz says, that extempore ornamentation was an expected part of 18th century performance practice. These bars are simpler than the surrounding material and thus seem suitable for embellishment, and many performers do ornament them. I think that it's important to maintain a sense of unpredictability here, as Colin Lawson does. If our ornamentation becomes predictable, then we risk losing the sense that we are extemporizing. I'm now going to move on to the concerto's second movement, which is effectively a modified da capo aria with an ABA form completed with the coda. After reading Tromlitz's 1791 treatise, I was initially planning to play the appoggiaturas that come at many cadence points here as two thirds of the main note's length. Tromlitz suggests that an appoggiatura before a dotted note should generally take two thirds of the main note's length. While there are many treatises on 18th century performance, Tromlitz has seemed the most relevant, given its chronological proximity to the concerto and also the fact that it is very self-aware, 
Fomlitz both references earlier treatises and analyzes their recommendations in relation to his own experience. However, it is important to not excessively rely on individual treatises for rules on how to play music from this period. We cannot assume that such a treatise written in Leipzig wholly reflected contemporary practices in Vienna. Indeed, Clive Brown has pointed out that Mozart, unlike many of his contemporaries, did seem to write out a podgeturas in the note values that he intended. And so, on balance, I have decided to perform these as semiquavers here, as written in the score. I want to move on to the movements B section. The slides show some of the amendments that I make to the traditional transcription when performing this passage on non-basic clarinet to smoothen the voice leading. The last part of this movement that I want to look at is the first part of the A section repeat. This passage is a perfect example of how ornamentation can be used to create harmonic interest in repeated sections, as the simple phrases lend themselves perfectly to the insertion of appoggiaturas and chromatic passing notes. The final movement is a rondo, concluding the work with the most virtuosic music found across the concerto. There are two passages in the rondo whose reconstruction I want to contrast. Here is the first.
As you can see on the slide, the editorial gymnastics in bars 61 and 62 here are relatively easy to see in the traditional non-Basset transcription. So this passage is easy to reconstruct for Basset clarinet. However, it is far harder to create a better version for non-Basset clarinet. Also shown in the slide is what I play in these bars when I'm using a non-Basset clarinet. Now, this is not ideal, but it does put back some of the lower register removed in the traditional non-Basset transcription. The second passage comes from some episodic material in the middle of the rondo. I'm not convinced by the Bärenreiter reconstruction here. Bar 147 becomes rather inelegant with the repeated low Ds. Instead, I play these bars as is printed in the early editions. This still means that the repeated motif is displaced by an octave on its second statement and removes the awkwardness otherwise found in bar 147. My last example comes from the final extended statement of the Rondo theme towards the end of the movement. We know that 18th century musicians often varied repeating themes. By the 1790s, it was also common for composers to write in their own ornamentation when they had a specific idea of how a given theme might be altered. Indeed, we know that Mozart sometimes wrote in his own ornamentation in Rondos, as in the Violin Concerto K219. However, there are few amendments to the rondo theme in this movement. Because of this, I like to emphasize the large structural restatement that comes here by adding in my own ornamentation. My research into the Mozart Clarinet Concerto has highlighted to me how problematic the sources surrounding the work are. We have to reconstruct what we can using our own artistic judgment. This gives us a lot of artistic license, which is great and we should embrace this. However, this does have to be paired with a knowledge of performing practices, which form a critical part of understanding 18th century repertoire. In this repertoire, the notation alone does not give us the full picture of how to approach performing a given work.